Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Nunley Math. I'm your host, Aaron Nunley. Thank you so much for joining us here today as we begin a look at graphs of functions. Graphs of functions. Now, in my class, we've spent several days now talking about what a function is, what a domain is, what a range is, and how those pieces fit together, as well as several different ways that we can look at functions, domains, and ranges in the relationship to each other, whether they be in tables, whether they be in um, equation or function form, whether they be listed as coordinates or whether we look at them in terms of their graph. What we want to do over the next series of videos is look at seven functions that we like to refer to as function families. These are functions that have specific applications in math. They're very, very common and they have a lot of patterns in them that are useful to us. So over the course of the next several videos, we're going to look uh, very quickly at each of these different function families. We're going to look for a few patterns that might be helpful or useful to us, and, and then maybe give you a few pointers that might help you in the future. Let me go ahead and show you the first one. Notice I have a function f of x equals 3x minus 4 f of x equals 3x minus 4. Now remember, this relation, or in this case, a function, it has a job of connecting our domain to our range, or matching our domain values to a range value. And the way that works is we take a value that we think can be in the domain, we insert it into our relation, or in this case, a function for x, and then the function tells us what number it should match to. So the rule is for any number x, or for any value you put into rule f as x, we're going to take 3 times that number and then subtract 4 from it, and then that's going to give you what range value or y value it matches to. In this case, if I were to insert a 0, 3 times 0 minus 4 would give me negative 4, or in coordinate form, 0 matches to negative 4, the coordinate 0, negative 4, which I can then demonstrate on my graph. Remember, the goal is always for the relation or function to match domains and ranges. This particular type of function is a very common function. Uh, it occurs a lot, uh, a lot in the real world as well as in math class. In fact, we spend most of the rest of the year in Algebra 1 talking about this particular type of function. Notice I'm not naming it yet because I don't want to give anything away. What we're going to do is we're going to plug in some domains into this function, and we're going to see what ranges pop out, then we're going to look at what patterns emerge. The, what I'm about to show you is probably the least efficient way for us to graph this particular function. It's a lot of work, it doesn't involve a high level of understanding of functions, so it's easy for us to do, but it is very time consuming. What we hope to do is by walking through this one time in a very, very long, drawn-out fashion, is we hope to identify some things we can use as shortcuts in the future so that we don't have to do this every single time. Now, if you're watching this video, um, my suggestion to you is that before you watch me stick in some domain and range values, and before you watch me graph those domain and range values, I would suggest creating your own domains, inserting them in, seeing what they match to, and then graphing them on your own. Hopefully you can see what this graph is going to look like before I tell you. That would be ideal. Notice, by the way, that our domain values always match to our x-coordinate, which is why we refer to the x-axis, the right and left movement, as the domain. And since f of x, or sometimes it's referred to as y, is our y-coordinate, or our up and down movement, we refer to the up and down motion as being the range. Here again, I'm going to assume you're pausing the video, you're sticking in your own points, you're seeing what happens, but um, for the sake of time, I don't want to spend too much time waiting on you, so I'm going to go ahead and keep going so you can restart the video whenever you're ready to go. I'm going to pick some values for my domain. Maybe I want to insert a 1. If I stick a 1 into this rule, this says every time you stick a 1 in, take 3 times 1 minus 4, and you get negative 1. 
or in coordinate form, that should be, oh, there's a little typo. This should be 1, negative 1. I'll have to go back and fix that later. This should be the point 1, negative 1, which we would graph here. That's to the right 1 and down 1. If I stick in a 2, 3 times 2 minus 4 gives me a 2. So I would have to graph the coordinate 2, 2, which is here, right 2, up 2. And I stick in a 3, and I get a 5, and I stick in a 4, and I get an 8, and I stick in a negative 1, and I get a negative 7, which is down here. Notice, by the way, I could have continued going higher and higher. I could have picked a 5, a 6, a 7. I like to pick things in order because it helps me see patterns. You can probably already look here and see something interesting or worthwhile. I'm not going to mention it yet, but hopefully you see something. Um, as I was moving up, I did notice a pattern. Um, that, that allows me to stop drawing because I can see the pattern to the right. What I want to do is look at what the pattern does to the left and see if that pattern continues. So that's why I picked a negative 1. Continuing to the left, I'm going to stick in a negative 2. That gives me a negative 10. And I can see my line. Notice I could have also done a negative 3 or a negative 4, or a negative 15, but at this point in time, you can see pretty clearly what this graph is going to do. It's going to make a straight line. All lines are straight, but people refer to it often as a straight line. So I've got a line that can be drawn through all of those points. In fact, because we can draw a straight line through those points, we refer to something in this form as being a linear equation. This is not the only form of a linear equation, but it is one of the most common forms of a linear equation. When you graph a linear equation, the graph is always going to be a line. That's really beneficial to us because if I can look at the function in the first place and look at this right away and say, oh, wait a second, this is linear, then I don't need to put 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I don't need to put 7 dots in my, in my chart and 7 dots on my graph. Instead, once I know 2 dots, I can just recognize that this has a constant rate of change and I can sketch the rest very, very quickly. So even though drawing this the first time took me a long time because I had to put so many points in my table, from now on, if I can spot that this is linear before I ever plot any points, I can go through here and draw this much, much faster. Now, the key characteristic for a linear function is right here. Notice you have an x to the first power. Linear functions will always have an x to the first power. So when I look at this and see, oh, I have an x to the first power, I know it's going to be linear, and all I need is any two points that I can connect to figure out how quickly it's growing. And from there, I just, um, I just draw and draw and draw the rest of it, and I'm pretty good to go. Very, very big time saver. If we can spot that it's linear, at the beginning by noticing the x to the first power. Now, I want to talk to you about the domain of this function. Remember, the domain is what x values can go into this function and produce a y value. Well, notice we've got a list of numbers here in our domain that we know work, and that negative 4 also works. We've got a list of numbers, but you can see from the arrow on the end that this doesn't stop at 4 or 5. The arrow shows that it would go on and go on. and go. In fact, this is going to go on forever and ever to the right. So if I'm looking at which x values work, we know 0 worked, we know 1 worked, we know 2, we know 3, we know 4. Judging from the pattern, I can see that this is going to continue forever to the right. If I start at 0 and go backwards, I can see that negative 1 had a value, negative 2 had a value, negative 3 appears to have a value, and if I were to continue this arrow on forever and ever, it looks as though it's going to go to the left forever as well. So I could draw this to show that. 
Notice, I'm going to the right forever. I'm also going to the left forever. That means that no matter what number I pick along the number line, if I stick it into this rule, I should get it to match to a range value. If I put in 1,000, I get 3 times 1,000 minus 4, which is 2,996. If I put in 10 million, I get, what, 29,999,996. No matter what you stick in here, something's going to come out. For that reason, if we're talking about the domain of this linear function, we would say the domain is all x's as long as x is a real number. In other words, any real number that I pick to put in is going to produce a value coming out. That's the domain. Here's in plain, uh, plain English, every input works as long as it is a real number. Of course, we would give this using function notation. Let me get rid of all these marks. They're starting to get on my nerves. Let me get rid of everything. Erase all the ink. Let's talk about the range. The range, you remember, is this set of y values that control how far up and down your dots go. So notice 0, negative 4 is right here. That works. Negative 1 worked. Negative 2 or positive 2 worked. Positive 5 worked. Positive 8 works. If I were to continue on, positive 11 works. And notice this graph is going up forever. I can also do the same thing going down. Negative 7 worked. Negative 10 worked. If I were to continue down here, negative 13 is going to work. And notice, because I'm connecting in between the dots, everything in between works. This graph goes up forever. This graph goes down forever. For that reason, we say the range is all f of x as long as f of x equals a real number. Every up and down value works as long as that up and down value is a real number. The graph goes up forever, the graph goes down forever. Not too bad, right? These things are all characteristics of a linear function. In fact, this domain and this range is true for almost every linear function. There are one or two exceptions, so you want to put the word almost in there. We'll talk more about those a little, uh, a little farther down the road, but basically there's only one linear function where this is not true. Not too bad, right? Now, ordinarily, if you were in my class, I would go on and give you another example, but I think that's going to make this video really, really long. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to end this video and call this video Part A. I'm going to have a second video uh, called Part B where we're going to look at a different function. Remember, our goal is to learn seven major function families. You've already got the first one. It's linear. Um, as always, make sure you tune back in and uh, check out our, our future videos. Make sure you like and subscribe. Leave us a comment in the comment section. And, of course, take care of yourselves, all right? It's nice hanging out with you. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.